Originally debuting as a solo album in 1970, Jesus Christ Superstar would soon after be adapted into a staged rock opera with several revivals and soundtrack releases, a 1973 film adaptation, a 2000 reimagining film, and, most recently, an NBC-produced live concert starring, among others, John Legend and Alice Cooper. Over its half-century run through Broadway and Hollywood, JCS has developed into one of the most beloved and commercially acclaimed musicals in recent memory. But as with any story tackling the subject of religion, and specifically Jesus Christ, JCS hasn't been without its fair share of controversy. Religious groups, both Christian and Jewish, have protested the musical for its alleged anti-Christian and anti-Semitic themes that, one could argue, don't actually exist. The primary criticism of certain Jewish groups was the one-dimensional and villainous portrayal of the Pharisees. Conversely, a number of Christian protesters complained that Judas Iscariot was portrayed with depth and humanity, while in the Bible, he is generally depicted as pure evil. But humanizing Judas wasn't the biggest sin committed by JCS. That honor fell to their characterization of Jesus himself. Many critics considered the idea of Jesus as fallible to be blasphemous. While Catholics in particular consider Jesus to be 100% God and 100% man, head lyricist Tim Rice had other ideas. It happens that we don't see Christ as God, but simply the right man at the right time at the right place, he was quoted as saying. We are basically trying to tell the story of Christ as a man. I think he increases in stature by looking at him as a man. Unsurprisingly, this attitude didn't go over well with Christians in the early 1970s, and the musical was mired in controversy from its first incarnation as a simple sung-through album. But did Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber really set out to create controversy, or to dismantle the most beloved icon in human history? Or were they simply trying to create something that could never be written by die-hard believers in Christ? Namely, a deeper examination of Jesus as a human being. It goes without saying that Jesus Christ is the most well-recognized figure of the last 2,000 years, whether real or fictional. From Hollywood blockbusters, to low-budget indie films, to instructional videos, to children's cartoons, Jesus has been adapted as a character literally countless times. We as a culture may have become desensitized to reboots and recasts after 15 Spider-Man movies, 22 Batman movies, 36 Godzilla movies, 60-plus Dracula movies, and over 250 film adaptations of Sherlock Holmes, but all of these rights-based IPs pale in comparison to the sheer number of appearances made by Jesus Christ, a real historical figure constantly adapted and recast into a nearly identical role every time. The life of Christ has frequently been referred to as the greatest story ever told. This is debatable, but an undeniably more accurate nickname would be the most frequent story ever told. Yet despite the constant retellings of the Gospels, hardly any of them has strayed from the source material, possibly due to the warning given in the Book of Revelation, which seems to imply that any changes to the New Testament will result in a slow, painful death and eternal torment. Despite the constantly recycled nature of Jesus as a protagonist, hardly anyone helming the story has attempted to include the most important and obvious element of a film character, personality. The concept of depicting Jesus as a flawed human being is underutilized, but not unheard of. Possibly the most well-known depiction of an emotionally complex Jesus comes from the 1988 film The Last Temptation of Christ, based on the 1955 novel of the same name. While The Last Temptation of Christ showed a brand new side of Jesus, brutally human and conflicted about his role in the world, Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice stayed closer to Jesus' depiction in the New Testament, merely extrapolating personality traits from what little we know of his life. On opening night of the musical, Rice even claimed in a New York Times interview that, quote, We've taken great dramatic license, but no major trait of character is there that was not in the Gospels. And while they did lean heavily into Jesus' more human moments from the Bible, such as his rage at the merchants in the temple or his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, most of what makes Jesus feel so human in the musical can be attributed to Rice's lyrics and Weber's score. Diving deeper into Jesus' depiction here would be impossible without first exploring the musical's protagonist, Judas Iscariot. It isn't unusual for an adaptation of the Gospels to focus primarily on someone close to Jesus, rather than Jesus himself. 
Films like King of Kings, Ben-Hur, The Miracle Maker, Judas, and The Robe tell the story of Jesus through the eyes of those adjacent to his mission. Figures who, though they appeared in the Bible, are regarded less highly than Jesus and are thus open to interpretation. This allows for filmmakers to keep Jesus resigned to the role he was given in the original Gospels. The Son of God, the King of Kings, the infallible, fully God, and fully man. Jesus Christ Superstar takes a similar approach, depicting Jesus through the eyes of his confidant and eventual betrayer, Judas Iscariot. But in this adaptation, Judas isn't seen as the definitive villain of the story, and his complaints against Jesus are perfectly valid. The opening musical number, Heaven on Their Minds, introduces us to a conflicted Judas. As well as being the only disciple with a developed personality, Judas has been rewritten into Jesus' right-hand man, taking the role traditionally associated with St. Peter. Not a massive change from the source material, but significant to his character. Judas's arc begins in media res as he watches Jesus from afar and performs a musical monologue detailing his discomfort with the direction of their ministry. At this point, he and the other apostles have been by Jesus' side for three years, spreading their message of love and peace throughout Israel. But recently, things have started getting out of hand. Judas recognizes that Jesus has changed from a simple preacher into a political and ideological figurehead, and is now being lauded as the Messiah foretold in Scripture. It should be noted that Judas is never seen to consider the possibility of Jesus truly being the Son of God. In the play, it is implied that this element of Jesus' existence has only entered the picture recently, and forms the prime evidence for Judas's concern. He believes that Jesus' role as the Messiah was forced on him by his followers, and that Jesus is making a mistake by accepting the title. Judas fears the Romans, as well as the Pharisees, but most of all he fears for Jesus' safety and sanity. This version of Judas loves Jesus as his closest friend, almost like a brother. But in the months leading up to the play, they have grown apart as Jesus falls into the crowd's adoration, and Judas becomes disillusioned with their mission. If Jesus was made more complex by Weber and Rice, his development pales in comparison to Judas's. While Jesus is hardly ever developed in other media, out of the Christian writer's fear of heresy, Judas is usually depicted as a starkly one-dimensional antagonist. Even in the Bible, he is given little to no motivation for his betrayal. The Gospel of Mark mentions Judas only four times, twice in passing, once to mention his meeting with the high priest, and once to depict the betrayal itself. The Gospels of Luke and John both imply that Judas was possessed by Satan, who used him as a vessel to deliver Jesus to the Pharisees. Only Matthew, who introduced the 30 pieces of silver to the story, includes a more sympathetic version of Judas, seeing him attempt to return the silver after realizing the full extent of his sins. So only by humanizing Judas could Weber and Rice successfully humanize Jesus. They form the yin and yang of the musical, the demigod who gets caught up in his own fame, and the mere mortal who attempts to reel him back in. The most important character trait of Rice's Judas, outside of his relationship with Jesus, is his genuine desire to do good, to help the less fortunate in a concrete way. This is perfectly exemplified in the Act 1 number, Everything's Alright, which has become probably the second best-known song from the play, just after I Don't Know How to Love Him, which was popularized later on by singer-songwriter Helen Reddy. Everything's Alright dramatizes the anointment of Jesus by Mary Magdalene, originally depicted in the Gospel of John, during which Mary shows her devotion to Jesus by rubbing his feet with expensive oil and wiping them off with her hair. In both the Gospels and the musical, Judas reacts harshly to this, rebuking Mary for wasting such expenses on Jesus when she could have sold the oil and donated the money to those who need it. The Gospel of John makes it clear that Judas had only selfish goals and, quote, said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. So when Jesus reminds Judas that there will always be poverty, while he has only a short time left in this world, Jesus appears to be in the right. However, in the musical, no mention is made of Judas's hidden intentions. He is genuinely upset that Jesus, who has recently grown to see himself as the Messiah his followers want him to be, is wasting money on personal pleasures. Jesus' response in the song is nearly identical to his dialogue from the Gospel, but without assuming Judas to always be in the wrong, his opinion comes across as snide and somewhat selfish, exactly what Judas fears he has become. In the original film adaptation, we're given a certain level of silent acting that isn't possible in a stage play. 
The first major example of this comes at the end of Everything's Alright, after Judas has been selfishly shut down by Jesus. We already know his feelings, exposited in Heaven on Their Minds, but his expressions in this scene, and the way he and Jesus slowly drift apart, tell the viewer that this is the moment he realizes it's all over. Jesus is no longer the man Judas came to love over the last three years. His focus is on himself, on enjoying his last few weeks on Earth, and no longer on fulfilling what Judas believes to be their primary mission of helping the less fortunate. The scene ends with a crowd of Jesus' followers paying tribute to him, hauntingly chanting the two simple words, everything's all right, as Judas watches in growing disbelief and finally leaves. In the original film, Judas is next seen watching from afar during the track Simon Zealots, in which Jesus stands still and allows himself to be worshipped by a crowd of anti-Roman revolutionaries. Although Jesus has no intentions of mounting a political revolution, he doesn't disabuse the zealots of their hopes, further cementing Judas's understanding that Jesus has crossed a line. The final nail in the coffin comes just after, when Judas witnesses Jesus tearing apart the market in the temple, becoming physically violent, apparently for his own selfish reasons. According to the structure of the musical, as well as the silent acting of the late great Carl Anderson, this is the moment when Judas decides something must be done to save Jesus from himself, and to preserve their legacy as peaceful ministers. Judas defects to the Pharisees, hoping they can stop Jesus before he goes too far. But for the length of their sung-through discussion, Judas continually makes excuses and flagellates himself for this betrayal. He doesn't know at this point that the Pharisees want Jesus dead, but he understands the moral implications of betraying a close friend, especially one so holy and revered. During the track Damned for All Time slash Blood Money, Judas reveals his main concern, which will become a running theme between he and several other characters, that of his lasting legacy. He worries that he will be, quote, damned for all time, not referring to literal damnation, but to the very real fate awaiting Judas after his death being seen as the one-dimensional villain of the Gospels for the next 2,000 years. Emotionally distraught and hating himself, this version of Judas initially refuses the 30 pieces of silver, only accepting it once the Pharisees remind him of his original goal, to help the less fortunate. By paying Judas for his betrayal, the Pharisees have highlighted what really matters to him. Doing the right thing, and being remembered as a good man, even if it happens without Jesus by his side. After the haunting chorus of angelic voices that wrap up Damned for All Time slash Blood Money, Judas's change in mentality is apparent. His actions become more disjointed, his motivations skewed, and even his solo verses become more uneven. He is losing his mind with guilt, and this is perfectly exemplified by the modern tanks and jet fighters seen in his wanderings through the desert. Similar to the demonic children who taunted Judas in The Passion of the Christ, these anachronistic vehicles are a visible depiction of his deteriorating mental state. The next time Judas and Jesus meet is at the legendary Last Supper, taking place in the Garden of Gethsemane, according to the film. Before their confrontation comes a rousing chorus from the other disciples, whose lyrics may be counted among the most ridiculous in the play, but are also the closest to any development the other ten are given. Like a proverbial middle finger to the fourth wall, the disciples chant, Always hoped that I'd be an apostle, knew that I would make it if I tried. Then when we retire, we can write the Gospels, so they'll still talk about us when we've died. Ignoring the obvious historical inaccuracies, this verse highlights the disciples' motivation. Like Judas, Pilate, and as we'll see shortly, Jesus himself, their main concern is with their lasting legacy, the way they'll be perceived by future generations. Unfortunately, as we know from the Bible, their most shameful hour is imminent, as they will soon either abandon Christ or try to take up arms against the Romans, or, in the case of Simon Peter, deny they were ever an apostle. As in the Bible, Jesus predicts Peter's imminent denial, as well as the betrayal of Judas. In the Gospels, Jesus tells Judas to do what he has to do, signifying Jesus' willingness to make his final sacrifice, and Judas leaves silently. This interaction is depicted more explosively in JCS. Jesus implies that he knows one of them will betray him, and Judas furiously lashes out, literally telling Jesus to cut the dramatics, a similar phrase to the one the Pharisees earlier used to placate Judas. Though still angry at Jesus, Judas tries to explain his actions. Jesus won't hear it, though, and angrily tells him to get on with it. 
Judas apparently takes this to mean that Jesus wants to be betrayed, incorrectly reading Jesus' motivations as closer to his biblical counterparts, and over the course of a few short lines seems to convince himself that he now despises Jesus, and turning him in is the only solution. In the film version, Jesus follows Judas away from the garden, apparently looking for a resolution. But Judas has had enough, and he viciously tears into Jesus, finally airing all his grievances. He tells Jesus that everything they built together has fallen apart, claiming that, quote, Our ideals die around us, and all because of you. He explains that someone had to turn Jesus in to save their legacy, and that he was the only one for the job. This infuriates Jesus, who pushes him away. Judas willingly leaves, but not before admitting that for all the complexities of their relationship, he just cannot understand why Jesus turned out the way he did. As per the Gospels, Judas returns that night with a horde of Roman soldiers, who arrest Jesus and bring him to Pontius Pilate, then to King Herod, and finally back to Pilate over a several-day trial period extended by Pilate's personal concern over Jesus' stature. The next time Judas appears, he has recently caught a glimpse of Jesus in captivity. Although the legendary flogging has not yet taken place, Jesus' treatment at the hands of the Roman soldiers is enough to send Judas into a spiral of remorse. He confronts the Pharisees, in a mirror image of damned for all time, all but begging them to understand that he never meant for this to happen. Although Judas speaks directly to Caiaphas, Annas, and the Pharisees, the subtext is clear. He is begging forgiveness from his former friend, who he still can't quite believe is all he claims to be. Caiaphas, having used and disposed of Judas, tries to calm him down. Unfortunately, he uses the worst possible language to do so. He tells Judas that his betrayal will be the, quote, saving of everyone, or saving of Israel, depending on the version, and that he will be remembered forever for this. Caiaphas means what he says, but he doesn't understand the effect it will have on Judas. Throughout the play, sustaining his legacy is one of Judas' prime motivations, and now the high priest himself has said that Judas will be remembered not as the man who helped the poor, but as the man who betrayed Jesus Christ to be beaten and possibly killed. Judas once asked Caiaphas to say he won't be damned for all time, but with a simple sentence like, you'll be remembered forever for this, Caiaphas does exactly that. He damns Judas to a death by his own hands, and he forces Judas to realize that he has damned himself in the eyes of all future Christians. Crying out for Jesus, Judas throws the thirty pieces of silver back at the Pharisees, as depicted in the Gospel of Matthew. In the film version, Annas moves to pick up the silver, but Caiaphas stops him. With the minuscule development of the Pharisees, one could interpret this as an act of disgust. Caiaphas used Judas for his own purposes, but has no respect for a man who would betray his friend. In his final moments, Judas tries to tell himself again that Jesus is no more than he appears to be. He reprises Mary Magdalene's iconic track, I Don't Know How to Love Him, revealing the doubts he's had all along about Jesus' true nature. He wonders if Jesus will let him be in death, or if his betrayal will follow them both into the afterlife. And, finally, with nowhere left to turn, Judas settles on the truth. The acting of Carl Anderson in this scene highlights the utter dread within Judas. No longer just guilt over betraying a friend, but the realization that he may have been part of a much grander scheme all along. For the first time, Judas allows himself to consider that Jesus truly was the Son of God, and all the implications of this. If Jesus is God, then Judas betrayed God himself. But if his role was the linchpin of a millennia-spanning scheme created by an eternal deity, then Judas had no agency of his own, and he was merely being manipulated by the very creator of the universe. Feeling the full weight of this realization chipping away at his sanity, Judas fearfully declares that, My mind is in darkness now. A sharp parallel to the very first line in the play, in which a cynical and self-assured Judas claims that, my mind is clearer now. Judas's rapid slip into insanity is climaxed by the inescapable fate of his character, suicide by hanging. Although the musical accompaniment and his increasingly unhinged lyrics work to sell his mental state, it wasn't until the film adaptation that the scene was truly put into perspective. Anderson's Judas stumbles through the desert, hardly able to stay on his feet, 
as he nervously glances behind him and watches the sky for what he believes is coming his way. Cutaway shots of clouds rolling across the sky tell us what is causing Judas' paranoia. He has been used by God himself, made the fall guy in an eternal saga of eldritch beings older than time itself. He was manipulated into committing the greatest sin in human history, and now he will be punished for it. Believing that God himself is out for blood, Judas takes refuge in what seems to be the only escape, instant death at his own hands. Rice and Lloyd Webber's depiction of Judas as a morally upstanding man forced into a bad situation of cosmic proportions is one of the most compelling aspects of Jesus Christ Superstar as a whole, and possibly what led to the musical's longevity in the minds of those who enjoy Broadway shows for more than just the spectacle. But Judas and his former friend aren't the only well-developed characters in the play. Despite considerably less screen time, the secondary roles are masterfully humanized and given a depth that couldn't be possible in the limited narrative of the Gospels. One such character is Mary of Magdala. Like earlier revisionist media such as The Last Temptation of Christ, or Bizarrely, a 2011 hit single by Lady Gaga, Jesus Christ Superstar depicts Mary Magdalene as a reformed prostitute, a myth created by the early church to rewrite Jesus' teachings on female autonomy. Through her few lines of dialogue, it is implied that Mary believes Jesus saved her soul, and possibly her life, by turning her from sinful ways. By ignoring the traditional story about Jesus literally exercising demons from her, Mary is given more agency, and uses this agency to, ironically, blindly follow Jesus in all his teachings. It is heavily implied that Mary's feelings for Jesus are romantic or sexual, and that she doesn't quite understand him as a man. Like Judas, she doesn't seem to believe that he is the Son of God, but she is willing to go along with anything he says. In fact, in Mary's final appearance in the musical, she stands beside Peter as he denies knowing Christ, and she is left wondering how Jesus could have predicted this turn of events. Another well-developed character in the play is Pontius Pilate, whose role is essentially to highlight the collateral damage of Jesus' ministry, the damage Judas had seen coming. While in the Gospel of Matthew, Pilate's wife warns him not to condemn Jesus due to a nightmare, JCS simplifies this story by attributing this dream to Pilate in a musical sequence appropriately titled Pilate's Dream. In said dream, Pilate witnesses a vision of Jesus being persecuted by his peers, but this quickly fades into an image of future generations, thousands of millions, crying out for Jesus and mourning his death. Most disturbing of all, Pilate intuitively understands that they all blame him specifically for the fate of their Lord. This dream has a profound effect on Pilate, who later refuses to condemn Jesus, instead sending him to Herod on the grounds that Jesus is not a Roman citizen. However, when Herod refuses to take him seriously, Jesus is sent back to Pilate, who begs Jesus to let him help. Like Judas, Pilate's primary motivation is his legacy, but he has more than intuition to inspire him. He has the memory of his dream, in which he is damned for all time, for his role in Jesus' death. Unfortunately, his dream is forgotten when he realizes that the very real crowd will riot and commit acts of violence if he fails to condemn Jesus. In his final verse, Pilate lashes out at Jesus for not lifting a finger to save himself, but in his final line, he seems to realize what this has all been about. Pilate refers to Jesus as a misguided martyr before changing his diagnosis to innocent puppet. This line can be interpreted differently depending on the production, but thanks to Barry Denon's stellar acting in the film version, the subtext couldn't be any more clear. Pilate has just settled on the realization that caused Judas to end his own life. That he, and the crowd, and the Pharisees, and even Jesus himself, are no more than pawns in a timeless, cosmic game of death and rebirth, in which neither side can be clearly defined as good or evil. But what about Jesus himself? Does he share the same human concerns as Pilate and Judas, or is he above all of this? The truth is somewhere in between. JCS depicts Jesus as human to a fault, even less visibly divine than Willem Dafoe's portrayal in The Last Temptation of Christ. He is never seen performing miracles or displaying impossible knowledge about the universe. In human feats such as his 40 days of fasting or even his resurrection are skipped over. At the core of Jesus' character, Rice and Lloyd Webber depicted a flawed, inconsistent, and occasionally selfish human being. 
Watching JCS through the unbiased eye of a non-Christian, Judas's consistent morality may come as a surprise. When he expresses concern about Jesus' arrogance in Heaven on Their Minds, he is vindicated in the very next song, What's the Buzz?, in which Jesus ignores the concerns of his disciples in favor of spending a sensual moment with Mary Magdalene. In the following track, Everything's Alright, Judas rebukes Mary for wasting her money on oil for Jesus. As previously stated, this version of Judas genuinely wants to help the less fortunate. Yet Jesus makes the apparently selfish claim that they should ignore their charity work in favor of spending time with him while he's still around. Jesus is not encouraged to focus on his mission by the other disciples, who are depicted as essentially mindless followers. Even when Jesus grows serious about his work, as in The Last Supper, he appears instantly frustrated at their lack of comprehension. Apart from the disciples and Mary, Jesus seems to revel in the praise showered on him by the crowds. In the early track, Hosanna, he enters Jerusalem to the cheers and praise of the locals, drinking it in with apparently no humility. When Caiaphas demands he make the crowd disperse, Jesus refuses, essentially explaining that he deserves this praise. His good cheer continues through this song until the last line, in which the crowd asks if he would die for them, and, at least in the film version, his smile immediately drops. At this point, his followers know nothing about his ultimate goal, so this line can be taken as a glimpse into Jesus' foreboding mind. For the first time in the play, we can see that Jesus knows the destiny that awaits him. This hidden sense of foreboding is expanded on in Poor Jerusalem, the second half of Simon's Zealots. Jesus spends the first half of the song soaking up the adoration from Simon and his friends while Judas watches in disgust. However, Judas leaves before the song is finished and is thus not present to hear Jesus' response. If he had been, maybe his opinion on his friend would have changed. For all his showboating, Jesus somberly admits to Simon that none of them understand his true mission, and that by focusing on political battles, they have forgotten what really matters. The first time Jesus is seen without any other protagonists is in the temple. First, he destroys the money changer stations in righteous, but possibly selfish, fury, prompting Judas to leave in disbelief. Again, Judas misses the second half of the song and fails to understand what Jesus is going through. After leaving the city, Jesus is set upon by a crowd of lepers and other disease-ridden outcasts who beg him for a miracle. Though he is sympathetic, Jesus is quickly overwhelmed by their numbers and begs them to leave him alone. Jesus' failure to heal the lepers, or even to comfort them, brings up the most important element of Jesus' character in any depiction, his genuine divinity. Jesus Christ Superstar dares to ask the question of whether or not Jesus was truly the Son of God, but more conversely, whether he was even sure himself. Even the last temptation of Christ depicts Jesus as convinced of his own divinity and able to perform miracles on command. But Rice and Lloyd Webber's version of Jesus is more uncertain. It's apparent that he used to believe in himself and God at the beginning of his ministry three years earlier, but as his death approaches, he becomes less certain if he believes in his own divinity, much less if he wants the job. Just like in the Gospels, the question of Jesus' divinity is brought up by those around him. In JCS, he's asked in different terms by Pilate, Herod, Judas, and others, while Caiaphas and Pilate struggle to figure out why Jesus is any different from the other Jews who have been hailed as possible messiahs. Unlike in the Bible, Jesus never answers definitively. His two-word confirmation, I am, is never used in the play, and his iconic, these are your words, not mine, is replaced with the less confident rhyme, it's you that say I am, I look for truth, and find that I get damned. Like Judas, Pilate, and, to a lesser extent, the disciples, Jesus is primarily concerned with his legacy, a concern which he may have felt in real life, but which is made all the more potent by 2,000 years of hindsight. Jesus knows that for all the praise of the crowd, his mission is hardly appreciated during his life. However, unlike the biblical Jesus, he is unsure whether he will be remembered after death. In Act 1's Strange Thing Mystifying, he complains that the disciples won't notice if he died, and later in the Garden of Gethsemane he seems to panic, realizing that none of them could possibly remember his teachings later on, as they don't even understand them now. For the entirety of the first act, Jesus is an enigma of a character. Through Judas's eyes, he appears to be a selfish, egotistical celebrity no longer interested in helping the less fortunate. 
To the Pharisees, he is a dangerous social engineer with the power to tear down the establishment, whether consciously or as collateral damage. From Mary's perspective, Jesus is a great man who saved her soul, whether or not he happens to be the Messiah. The second half of Simon Zealots and the Temple are the closest the viewer will come to understanding Jesus' character in Act 1. And even then, all we can see is that he is confused, uncertain, and afraid of being forgotten. It isn't until the second track of Act 2 that Jesus lays all his cards on the table, allowing the audience to finally understand him as a character. Directly following The Last Supper, Gethsemane is Jesus' only solo track in the play, a high-energy, high-octave song belted masterfully by generations of actors who understood the physical demands of its high notes, if not the importance of the track as the key to the play's narrative structure. As in the Bible, the disciples fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane, leaving Jesus awake to worry about the future. According to all four Gospels, Jesus did ask his Heavenly Father to, quote, remove this cup from me, although he immediately resigns himself to God's plan, saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine, be done. This moment in the Bible shows a more human side to Jesus, who is generally seen to be unworried about the future. However, Jesus Christ Superstar takes this narrative a step further, flexing its soundtrack to hammer home the idea that Jesus doesn't understand his own existence any more than his friends. Gethsemane begins with a quote almost directly from the Bible, whereby Jesus asks God the Father to take this cup away from me. But this version of Jesus doesn't surrender so quickly. He admits things have changed for him, claiming that, quote, I'm not as sure as when we started. He recalls the beginning of his ministry three years earlier, saying that the length of his mission seems like 30 years, later 90, then asks the most telling question of all, could you ask as much from any other man? The answer to this question seems obvious. Jesus is no ordinary man, and the crucifixion of anyone else would not have the same cosmic ramifications. But again, this version of Jesus is no longer sure that he really is the Son of God. And if he isn't, then his death will mean nothing. Jesus continues this line of questioning, demanding to know if his death would count for something. Would I be more noticed than I ever was before? Would the things I've said and done matter anymore? We now see that Jesus is more concerned with his legacy than Judas or Pilate ever could be. He is risking everything, his very existence in this universe, on the mere hope that he isn't delusional. Just as he did in The Last Temptation of Christ, this Jesus wonders if the success of his mission would make that much of a difference, or if he could move on and live a normal life as a human being. In the most emotionally charged moment of the musical, and with the highest and loudest single note, Jesus makes his ultimate decision. No matter what the consequences, he will continue with the plan and go along with his betrayal and ultimate death. However, this is not a Jesus who has surrendered to his father's plan. Rice and Lloyd Webber's Jesus does not say, Not my will, but thine be done. He screams out in a confused cloud of emotions the simple yet telling line, All right, I'll die. Just watch me die. He hasn't seen the light or realized the true importance of his mission. He has resigned himself, begrudgingly, to the path laid out for him before his conception, and this attitude will remain present for the rest of the play. It should also be noted that in the film version, Jesus' decision is punctuated by a montage of later paintings depicting the crucifixion, implying that he has seen his potential for inspiring future generations after his death. After this climactic decision, Jesus regresses into a somber, reflective verse, recalling his long path to this moment. But he quickly lashes out again, demanding that God understand this isn't what he wants. He reminds his father that, quote, Thy will is hard, but you hold every card, almost seeming to hope that the omniscient creator of the universe will experience a pang of guilt for his decisions. After this verse, Jesus' internal conflict has come to an end. He is fully resigned to his fate, though he continues to make it clear that it wasn't his decision. When Judas reappears in the garden, accompanied by Roman soldiers, the disciples attempt to defend Jesus. While in the Bible Jesus rebukes them for choosing violence, this Jesus depressedly tells them that their ministry, quote, was nice, but now it's gone. Immediately after, when Jesus is paraded to Caiaphas in chains, the same crowds who praised his name in Hosanna demand to know why he isn't putting up a fight, quickly losing their respect for him and ultimately coming to resent him as a criminal. Through his confrontations with Pilate and Herod, 
Jesus does not speak a word to defend himself in accordance with God's plan, but neither does he display any belief in himself. He refuses to call himself king of the Jews to Pilate, and he refuses to speak at all when goaded by Herod. When Pilate later asks Jesus where his kingdom can be found, Jesus sadly admits that there may be a kingdom awaiting him after death, though he can't say for sure. Due to mounting pressure from the Pharisees and Jesus' former fans, Pilate ultimately decides to ignore his prophetic dream and have Jesus first flogged, then crucified. Jesus accepts this sentence without a word, and the final scene in the musical depicts him hanging on the cross, dying without ever knowing whether his life and death actually meant anything, or if he wasted his only chance at human existence for a fantasy. Ultimately, Jesus speaks a version of his final sentence as depicted in the Gospel of Luke. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. One of the only spoken lines in the play, the significance of this dialogue could be debated. Perhaps in the end, despite being tortured and murdered, Jesus discovered that he truly did believe in God the Father and his own divinity. Or, a bleaker possibility, Jesus simply wanted to appease God on the off chance that he was a mere mortal, and capable of going to hell. Luckily, the play doesn't end on an entirely somber note. Although the crucifixion and Jesus' death encompass the final scene, they are preceded by one of the more upbeat tracks the musical has to offer. Simply titled Superstar, this song is led by a post-suicide Judas, accompanied by a chorus of angels. Now with the perspective of an immortal spirit, Judas confronts Jesus, who appears in the afterlife despite his death being depicted shortly after. In the film version, the afterlife is left ambiguous. Judas and the angels wear all white, implying heaven, but the set is constructed of ugly stones and red spotlights, implying hell. Although Judas has been cleansed of his insanity, and even makes reference to the modern world, he still expresses confusion at Jesus' actions during his time on Earth. He wonders if Jesus planned for his mission to end the way it did, or if he could have accomplished his goals without a violent death. The chorus of angels ask Jesus who he really is, and if he now believes in his own divinity. Judas, in the second verse, compares Jesus to Buddha and Muhammad, wondering if he really managed to accomplish something no other religion has. Jesus says nothing, and no resolution is offered. At the end of the musical, the question still stands, as it has for 2,000 years. Who, or what, was Jesus of Nazareth? The question of Jesus' divinity can never truly be answered, but another question raised by JCS may be easier to tackle. The question of whether Jesus' life and death accomplished anything. According to Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber, Jesus' greatest fear was that he would suffer a brutal death and quickly be forgotten. In the musical, he is so concerned with this eventuality that he risks alienating his closest friends by essentially calling them out for being unobservant and unintelligent, even up till the moment in the Garden of Gethsemane when he reveals his body and blood in the bread and wine. Perhaps this concern was felt by the real Jesus 20 centuries ago. If so, it wasn't warranted. If Jesus' mission on Earth was to create a religion that would take humanity by storm, then he was more successful than a normal man could possibly imagine, with today's population of Christians reaching over 2.4 billion, almost a third of the entire human race. If Jesus' mission was to spread a message of brotherly love, then his success was a little more controversial. Only a blind follower would try to argue that Christianity is without its sins or bloody mistakes. But no matter the faults of organized religion, Jesus Christ remains to this day the most important historical and religious figure in human history, synonymous with the concepts of forgiveness, mercy, and love to those who have not bastardized his mission to harm others. If the real historical Jesus shared any of the concerns and foreboding depicted in JCS, then he can rest easy. He was never forgotten, and his ministry is still affecting the world today. Even non-Christians such as Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber recognize the life of Christ as, if not the greatest story ever told, then at least a brilliant starting point for exploration of the human condition.